One of the first videos I posted was for Bitterballen, and a lot of people have made it and enjoyed it. However, it was broken up over two videos, one for making the filling, which we actually used in a different dish, and then the Bitterballen. And even though Bitterballen and Croquette are practically the same thing, I still get a question from time to time, someone saying, do you have a recipe for a croquette? So today we are making croquette from scratch and we're doing it all in one video. Hi, I'm Twan and welcome to my kitchen. If you're new to this channel, I focus on cooking foods from my home country, the Netherlands, and some of its former colonies, such as Indonesia. Today we are making croquette. Croquette are a very popular snack back in the Netherlands and they are either eaten by themselves with some fries or on a roll. There are restaurants in most of the bigger cities where there is a wall with little glass cubbies with a snack in it. And you put in some money, open one of the little glass doors and pull out a deliciously hot snack. The restaurant that is most popular for this is called Fabo and that name is derived from its very first location in Amsterdam on the Ferdinand Bolstraat. You will need one kilogram or two and a quarter pounds of brisket. Trim off any excess fat. You don't have to get rid of all the fat, but trim off some of the bigger pieces. One small bunch of parsley. We buy basically a regular sized bunch at the grocery store and this is about half of it. One large onion, two bay leaves and two bouillon cubes. You will also need approximately a liter and a half or one and a half quarts of water. Of course, we're not going to put the entire onion uh, in the broth. So leave the root on because that way the onion stays together and it's easily removed from the broth. But cut off the tip and then cut it into two even pieces and peel off the papery skin. Some people, I've seen some chefs dump the whole onion in with the skin and everything. I don't know why, but I just don't like to do that. Cooking the meat and making the broth couldn't be easier if you have an electric pressure cooker. Because what we're going to do is we are going to put it all in here. Onions, parsley, meat, <laughs> bay leaves, and a liter and a half of water. It's okay if the onions are not completely submerged. They're just there to impart flavor to the broth. I'm gonna put the lid on. Turn on pressure, high pressure cook for one hour. The Instant Pot ran for an hour and we let it sit for approximately 20 minutes and now it's time to do a natural release. So we're gonna move this to venting. Step away. Now that the steam is released, we're going to remove the lid and fish out the onion and the parsley, as well as the bay leaf. So even though we kept the root on the onion, some pieces are still coming loose, but that's okay, because we're gonna end up straining the broth, but this way, most of the onion just stays together. I'm gonna put the beef on this platter. I'm going to bring this liquid to a boil using the saute mode of the pan. And what I wanna do is actually reduce the liquid by about a third. So once this hits a boil, I'm going to add the bouillon cubes to it and stir it to make sure that it's fully dissolved. And then when it hits about a liter of liquid, so one third down, um, it's ready to go and I will turn off the pan. Now we have to cut the brisket into little pieces. Even though I could shred it, the strands would be too long to fit in a croquette. So one of the differences when I make croquette versus bitterball actually is the size of the cubes I cut. Because in a croquette, which is larger, I can actually deal with slightly longer strands. Where in a bitterball that is much smaller, I don't want to have to um, deal with really long pieces of, uh, of, of meat. So I can cut slightly larger pieces than I did in the bitterballer video. And I'll put a link to that video in the description below, um, but still not too large. So I'm cutting maybe a, an inch wide and now I'm gonna rotate it and cut it an inch in the other direction. It's okay if it falls apart. Like I said, the main goal of this is to keep the strands nice and short. 
or not too long, I should say. If you have really big pieces of fat like I see over there, I typically remove that after I cut it. Now that I've removed all the fat and cut the, the meat, I'm going to put it into this dish and let it cool down. Um, once it's cooled down enough, I'm going to cover it with some plastic wrap and then store it in the fridge because we're going to not need it for a little while. The broth is boiling, so now I'm going to add my two bouillon cubes. And we're going to stir it until they're fully dissolved. Now we're just going to let it boil uh, until it reduces to the right amount, which is about a third less. So the broth has cooked down and now I'm going to pour it through a strainer. This is a step that is not absolutely necessary, but it will end up with the clearest broth. A clear broth makes a clear roux. That is why I'm doing it, but you don't have to do it. As a matter of fact, I don't think I did it um, in the Bitterballe or the Rahu video. Once it's cool enough to go in the fridge, we'll cover it with plastic wrap and then let this come, uh, let this cool down in the fridge for probably two hours, maybe even longer. While we're in between steps of making croquette, right now is a great time for you to click the like and subscribe button. It will really help my channel. If you want YouTube to notify you whenever I post something new, click that bell. The meat and the broth are done cooling off in the fridge, so it's time to make the filling. For the filling, you will need 120 milliliters or grams of water, uh, room temperature, 120 grams of all-purpose flour, 120 grams of butter at room temperature, a handful of finely chopped fresh parsley, one teaspoon of white distilled vinegar, one teaspoon of mustard, freshly grated nutmeg, a little bit more than a pinch, and two tablespoons of gelatin. We're gonna start by making a roux, and for that, all you will need is butter and flour. So let's go over to the stove. The first thing you have to do is melt the butter. So I'm putting the butter over medium heat in a large heavy bottom saucepan. And once it's fully melted, we are going to add the flour. Make sure you don't have your flame on too high. You don't wanna add any color to the butter as you're melting it. The butter is completely melted. So now it is time to add the flour. So once the flour is fully incorporated, keep cooking it and stirring it for five minutes. This will make sure that you cook out all the raw flour flavor. So now that we have cooked this for five minutes, I'm gonna turn the flame to low and get the cold broth from the fridge. Other than just looking at the clock and knowing you've cooked it for five minutes, you can kind of tell that it's ready to get broth at it when it looks like wet sand like this. So I'm gonna put the heat back to medium and now we're going to add one cup or 250 milliliters of broth at a time until we have added at least a liter of broth. So we're going to add one, two, and now we're going to stir this until all the lumps are gone. And with this little broth, what I can tell you is gonna happen is it's going to get to be this kind of really thick, almost like a dough or a batter. And that's exactly what you want. So we're gonna keep stirring this until everything is incorporated. And then we're gonna add another two ladles. Yep, there you are, you see it's gotten really thick. So now we're going to add two more ladles. Keep stirring this until it forms one uniform mixture and you wanna make sure that you do not see any lumps. It's actually looking pretty good. So time to add two more ladles. And repeat the whole process. Stir gently now that you have 
more of this in the pot because you don't want to make a mess on the stove. Keep stirring it until there are no more visible lumps. So the sauce is getting pretty thin. It's not thin enough yet, but I worry that if I add two ladles, it may become too thin. So I'm going to add one ladle, stir it through, and then make a judgment call on whether or not I want to add that last ladle of broth. Keep stirring it, and you definitely do not want this to turn brown. This is the perfect color. So I think it is not quite thin enough, and it can probably stand to get a full ladle more. So I'm going to add one more ladle. So I think this is the right consistency. So I'm gonna turn the flame down. The test is always on the back of the spoon. Just run your finger through it. And if the line that you just drew stays on there and doesn't fill back in, you know that it is good. We are adding a generous pinch of salt. Some freshly cracked black pepper. If you want to keep the roux to be completely blonde, you can also use white pepper, but I like the flavor of black pepper better. The vinegar, the mustard, a generous pinch of the freshly grated nutmeg. We're going to stir this, increase the temperature and bring it to a boil. Once this comes to a boil, you want to lower the heat so it just barely bubbles. So you want to simmer it, uh, but you want to keep stirring it for five more minutes. So as you can see, it is starting to boil. So I'm going to lower the temperature and now we are going to keep stirring it for five more minutes. So we've turned off the flame after the five minutes was done. And now I'm going to let this cool off until it's between 48 and 60 degrees Celsius. That is 120 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And once it hits that temperature, we can add the gelatin. So I'm going to take it off the stove and I'm going to kind of keep stirring it from time to time because that will help cool it off. We're going to take the two tablespoons of gelatin, powdered gelatin, and add it to the water and let it bloom for at least 10 minutes. Just to give us an idea, I'm gonna take the temperature and right now it is 183 degrees. So we have quite a bit to go, that's Fahrenheit. Let's check the temperature and it is 138 degrees. So perfectly in the zone. So one of the things I forgot to tell you why you need to uh, stir it other than just kind of help cool it off faster. It also prevents a skin from forming on this. So now we're going to take this bloomed gelatin and we're going to stir it until it is completely melted and you can no longer see little pieces of gelatin in here. If you have a hard time dissolving this or melting it in here, you can just take it to the stove and over a low flame stir it through until all the gelatin is uh, completely dissolved or melted. You have to be really thorough with this. Run your spoon through the sauce to see if you see any pieces of gelatin because trust me, taking a bite out of a piece of uh, gelatin is not what you want when you're eating a coquette. Stir it, keep checking it, that all of the gelatin pieces are gone. And when you think you have it, stir some more, just to be sure. I actually think we are where we need to be. So following my own advice, I'm going to stir a little more. Now that the gelatin is dissolved, we can add our meat. When I took the meat out of the refrigerator, I noticed that there were some pretty big chunks still um, in there. So I used a couple of forks to break them down a little bit smaller. Don't just dump it in because it's gonna splash everywhere. With a pair of tongs, just add a little bit at a time. And then we are going to stir it through. And this will lower the temperature of the gravy or the sauce, which will start the gelling power, if you will. And once we have this mixed through, we're going to add the parsley. So now that I have only a little bit left, I'm just gonna do this. Let's 
stir it through. Fantastic. And now we're going to add the parsley. So I'm using the same dish that I cooled the meat in to pour this in because we need to cool this in the fridge. Make sure you scrape it all out because all of this is delicious. I'm going to use a spatula to get the last little bit out of the pan. So now I will be covering this with cling film and I'm actually going to press the film right on the rahu or the the meat in the gravy to prevent a skin from forming. And we're gonna put it in the fridge overnight. Welcome back, it is the next day. The croquette filling has firmed up in the fridge overnight. I have it here at the ready to start making and shaping croquette. You'll need some, a few other things. 300 grams of plain breadcrumbs, two tablespoons of milk, and four eggs. I'm going to make a quick egg wash out of the four eggs and the milk, and then we'll start shaping the croquette. I'm going to be wearing some gloves when I shape the croquette. Uh, you don't have to, but if you're gonna do it without gloves, just make sure your hands are impeccably clean. It is a three-step process. We're gonna take one scoop of the filling, a little bit too much, and we're going to shape that into a log. A traditional croquette is 10 centimeters, four inches long, and about one and a quarter inches uh, in diameter. Now, I don't know if that's what this is, but this is good enough. We're now going to roll it into the breadcrumbs. Make sure that there are breadcrumbs on the edges as well. Roll it into the egg wash, take it out. Just let some of the excess drip off. And then we are going to roll it into the breadcrumbs again. Make sure it is covered. Shake off excess and put them onto a plate. And we're going to continue doing that until you have used up all of the filling. So I've reached the last of the meat filling. And this is making a total of 15 croquette. The other 10 are already in the fridge. Roll this, shape it. And it's okay if they don't have a perfect shape because it won't affect the taste at all. So, and just make sure it is all the way covered. So we're gonna put these in the fridge for at least two hours and then we'll fry them. It's been two hours and now it is time to start to fry the croquette. I have a Dutch oven filled with oil to about the halfway mark. You don't wanna overfill it because you don't want the oil to um, boil over and hit the stove. So I'm only going to do probably one croquette at a time because this, these croquettes are pretty big and this pan is not that large and each one of them goes in for five minutes. I have the oil heated up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 180 degrees Celsius. I'm using a constant read thermometer to keep monitoring the oil so I can keep adjusting the flame and when I take this croquette out, I'm gonna put it on an inverted rack on top of paper towel, and I will wait putting in the next croquette until the oil hits 350 degrees again. We don't have to worry about the temperature of the filling because everything is fully cooked. So we're really going uh, by color. And like I said, five minutes should be just about the right amount of time. Okay, that was five minutes. It is nice and golden brown. Now we're going to put it on the rack. Okay, the oil is at temperature. I'm gonna put in the second one and start the five minute timer. We're down to frying the last croquette. Um, every so often just skim through the oil to get any of the breadcrumbs out of the oil. Um, if your oil gets too dirty, your croquette will most likely burst open. Oil is at temperature, and we're going to do the last croquette. And the last croquette is done. All the croquettes are done. I started with 15, but as I was frying them magically, one of them disappeared. But that's okay, we still have plenty. So 
I'm gonna pick one and make a broodje croquette. A broodje croquette is a delicious croquette on a bun, typically with a little bit of mustard or mayo. But before I make it, let's cut one open. Let's cut it, let's cut open the croquette. So you can see the inside, oh, it's steaming. So as you can see, the inside is hot and the gelatin melts because of the temperature of the oil. So it liquefies the insides completely. You have a very nice and crispy outside. So let's make a broodje croquette. We're gonna put just a little bit of mustard on the top and bottom of the bun. And then you get to do the fun thing of smashing the croquette. This is not something you cut. You just take a big bite and enjoy it. Eet smakelijk. Mm. That's delicious. I just love the different textures. You have the fluffy bread, the crunchy outside of the croquette, and then the hot, meaty, gravy inside. And you can taste a little bit of the parsley. And yeah, just overall, absolutely delicious. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like and subscribe button and share it with your friends. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'm gonna post a written recipe on my website, twanskitchen.com, and please follow me on social media. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.